They are the kings of the Australian outback. You've got to concentrate all the time. Some of the biggest trains in the world. Things go wrong with these things. Normally makes a big mess. On epic journeys through a hostile continent. I don't know what we're going to do. We slow down and blow the horn. A nation depends on them. Oh God, boys, get into it. And the teams that keep these metal monsters on the tracks. Yeah. Hauling huge loads of food, freight and mineral riches across incredible distances. We are out in the middle of nowhere, that's for sure. Big trains, big country. Railroad Australia, on board one of the toughest rail journeys on the planet. A super train crossing the scorching Australian continent. The major concern is we could have derailed. Running non-stop for two days. Because sometimes you don't make it. It's man and machine in the ultimate endurance test. <laughs> on the rugged west coast, an ore train 100 wagons long the workhorses of a billion dollar industry. But what happens if the trains stop? Shutting the railway down is not a very fun game. And riding the roughest rails to nowhere. Oh. It's when their fur touches the train and it starts getting close. A vintage outback train, still running, picking up the strangest passengers. Having a long drawn out death in the sun, no animals At the maintenance sheds of Melbourne Freight Company, SCT Logistics, three locomotives are getting ready for a marathon 6,000 kilometre trek. Starting in Melbourne, across to Adelaide, and then over the continent to the most isolated city in Australia, Perth, and back again like going from London to New York by train. Nearly two kilometres long. As tall as a two-storey house, these super-sized trains supply Australia's most isolated city. If they don't get through, the supermarket shelves start to empty. We've got 4,500 tonne, and we've got about 1,650 metres. At top speeds of 110 kilometres an hour, the drivers have plenty to worry about. Gusting winds that could blow their double-stacked containers off the rails, track buckle from the blistering heat, floods washing away the tracks from under them. The train came apart, and at that stage we didn't know what was wrong. It's tough out there. First thing I'm going to do is check the level in the uh, oil level in the compressor. And Graham Smith has to make sure these long distance workhorses can face this hostile country. We just have a, just a general look around to make sure there's no pipes leaking or uh, there's a few rubber pipes there to make sure they haven't split. There's already been a casualty on the trip back from Perth. A wheel set on one of the towering refrigeration wagons needs replacing. Changing this wheel because of these spores. The chunks of metal that have been are missing from the wheel, as it rolls over the rail, it makes a thumping noise. So a thump, 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 and that ruins the track. Surprisingly enough, it's easier to change one of these than it is to change a car wheel. As long as you've got a forklift. I've got a locomotive that weighs uh, 126 tonnes on top of me at the moment. Uh, especially on the Nullarbor plane, these locomotives will uh, unfortunately hit camels. Camels and other wild animals. Sheep and stray cattle. They make one hell of a mess. Just wash it off and uh, send it out again. Loading up these mega trains are machines with incredible strength lifting 30-tonne containers like cardboard boxes. Inside giant cold rooms, milk, ice cream and other perishables are loaded into refrigerated cars. Out on the desolate Nullarbor, 
temperatures can reach a scorching 50 degrees and more. Inside these wagons, it will stay at minus 18. It's not just the desert that needs crossing. Between Melbourne and Perth, there are also the Adelaide Hills. The Adelaide Hills are horrendous. Steep grades that push a train to its limits. Long, windy, there's a lot of curves. Locomotives hate curves. They try to climb up over the rails. These hills are tough in the dry. Water on the line can cause havoc. The SCT train is due here in a few hours and the forecast is for rain. From Melbourne, 4,000 kilometres away. To the mighty ore carriers of Western Australia. The biggest and heaviest trains in the world. Stretching up to four kilometres in length, they snake through the wilds of the outback over red hot dirt. Each train load can be worth up to two million dollars. A nation's economy depends on keeping these wheels turning night and day. At the Carrara mine site, 400 kilometres northeast of Perth, giant loaders are hard at work, filling over 100 wagons of a bulk ore train carrying iron ore magnetite. It's a massive operation. Last financial year, we uh, shipped 9.4 million tonnes. And it's George Savell's job to keep it all moving. Keeping these trains running between the mine and the port of Geraldton, 200 kilometres away. Getting it off the trains and into ships bound for the hungry steel mills of China. George is the boss of a multi-million dollar operation. Half a million dollars a day, just in rail costs alone. But today, he's got problems. A dangerously high tide and its surging currents have closed the port. For those that haven't heard a tidal surge before, it's, um, it's a fairly heavy storm current that comes out of the Southern Oceans. And uh, for us, unfortunately, Champion Bay, where we have our port, is perfectly positioned to funnel the tidal surge. The extreme tides have brought the loading of the bulk ore carrier Illawarra Fortune to a standstill, with other empty ships standing idle out at sea. At this stage, George's trains are still running. So is the high-tech unloading facility. Tipping two wagons at a time, taking less than two minutes to empty a set. Right now, ore is flooding in, mountains of it. But it's not going out, and that's a huge problem. The whole time that that uh, vessel sits there and we're not loading it, it's time that we're filling the shed and uh, starting to get towards capacity. If the Illawarra doesn't sail on Friday morning, we'll be staring down the barrel or shutting the railway down. From the west, across the continent, to the tropics of far north Queensland. Get ready for one of the wildest train rides you'll ever take. Along some of the roughest track and toughest terrain in the outback. This is the Savannah Lander. Lee Johns and Will Kemp are its drivers. I've never ever got up in the morning and thought, ah, uh, you know, work. It's like no other job. Spectacular scenery. Down there, you've got yourself a crocodile. Bashing along century old bush tracks. Stopping to help stranded strangers. No, all in a day's work for this extraordinary relic from the past. Will and Lee's Outback Adventure starts in the Cairns Rail Workshops, 
before the sun has risen. Right, mate, uh, setting back. Colby. They're heading out on an 800 kilometre round trip. They'll be travelling from Cairns in tropical far north Queensland, 420 kilometres west to the old gold mining outpost of Forsyth. It's wet outside and there's a mountain range to climb before they hit the outback. Light rain can, can be a little problematic with the wheels spinning a lot. Um, so where we're heading up this morning, up the McAllister range towards Coranda uh, through rainforest areas. So what you get then is the leaves from the trees in the rainforest laying on top of the track. Wheels go over the leaves, crush the leaves into an oil and then mixed with the water, of course, becomes very, very slippery. Uh, the right-hand side is going to give you the good views. Thank you. High up in the mountain range, the weather is closing in. Welcome aboard the Savannah Lander for whatever you're doing this week. There's various different trips on board, whether you're going to Mariba or Coranda. If the rain gets any heavier, these passengers may not be going anywhere. It's a clear evening in Melbourne, but at the SCT depot, it's the weather 700 kilometres away that's the concern. OK, thanks, mate. It's raining in the hills outside Adelaide, and that could mean trouble for this train. The Adelaide hills have probably got uh, a 1 in 40 grade, which is about as steep as you can get. But with the length and the weight of our train, the actual drag makes it a harder journey for the guys. Mechanic Graham Smith has to make sure his locos are well armed for the fight. This box here has, uh, I think it's 76 kilograms of sand in there. Plenty of sand for when the wheels start slipping. Have to supply sand through here, out the nozzle and spray sand into that area there. After 24 hours of prepping and loading, 3MP9 is ready to get going. Destination, Perth, more than 3,000 kilometres away. Drivers Mark Wolverson and Paul Matley will be in charge of the first leg of this cross-continent marathon. They'll do the first leg out of Melbourne. And you should have the release and we're right to go, over. You should have a signal any second. Roger, th uh, thanks, Control. Paul will drive. Right to go when you get the light, driver. While Mark does the paperwork and communicates with track control. Hey, man, the line, we'll go in. Two SCT spotters will watch every inch of the train as it rolls out of the depot, checking for anything that could cause a problem. An open door, a loose hose, a noise that isn't right. See you later. The train is pulling its own crew car, its own mini hotel with five air-conditioned bedrooms, shower, kitchen and a lounge area. So it's, it, it is a home away from home. Boss Andrew sometimes joins his crew on the Perth trip to keep him in touch with the problems his drivers encounter. 1,652 metres for a gross weight of 5,043 tonnes. It's a big train. <laughs> See you on the return. 3MP9 is picking up speed but it's an unusually rough, noisy ride through Melbourne's outer suburbs. We're probably doing about 60, 60 odd kilometres an hour at the moment. Uh, that rate will take us about 15 to 20 minutes to clear the outskirts of Melbourne. When you're out on the Nullarbor, mainline speed's 110 kilometres an hour. When we reach Adelaide, uh, four drivers will get on. They will have their, their own crew car similar to this one. Uh, though they're taken through to Perth and back. But Perth is three days away and 3MP9 is about to run into trouble. Uh, when they arrive 
Jack in Adelaide, another two drivers will relieve them to bring them through to Horsham, and then another two drivers. Three thousand kilometres away, near the port of Geraldton. Another train laden with 7,000 tonnes of iron ore magnetite has arrived at the Carrara port facility. A dangerous high tide has stopped ships being loaded, but the trains running to the port are still being emptied. Yeah, Roger, I've got here by 13 to 16, that's all good. That's all good. Yeah. Roger, mate, cheers. This is the vital link between the mine and the dock side. Yeah, 761, that's pretty good there. Um, can I get your loco brakes on when you're in? Watch that, local brakes are applied. These tippers can unload a 100 wagon train in two hours. Lasers are used to guide the cars into exactly the right position for tilting. Today, the tipping is being controlled by Mark Horn. His computer's monitoring the movement of every wagon. But this morning, the punctual arrival of each train is giving Carrara operations manager, George Savell, a big headache. The ships can't be loaded and the ore stockpile is growing into a small mountain. We only have so much shed room in Gerald and once that shed room is full, we have to shut the railway down. Shutting the railway down is not a very fun game. At this stage, we've got room for two more trains to fit in the shed, and then we may be looking at cancellations. And George's day is about to get worse. Back at the mine, one of the loader drivers has also run into trouble. I just heard his noise in the cab, and then um, I looked down at the temperature gauge, and there she was up where she wasn't supposed to be, and yeah, then I got out, had a look, and seen the leak. Andrew Williams' Perth-bound freight train has got off to a bumpy start. And then another two drivers. What'd you hit then? It's hit something hard, and the emergency brakes have locked on. You receiving, Mark? Yeah, sorry, Andrew. We're pulling up, Mark. We've lost our air. Okay, thanks. The air. air pressure that runs from the locomotives through the train keeps the brakes off the wheels. When it's lost, the brakes clamp on automatically. This train's going nowhere. Yeah, Geelong Control, 3MP9 at Elders. Uh, Lara, we've lost our air, mate, just letting you know. Over. Yeah, no worries, thanks, mate. There's a fair jump in the track. Um, so we could have uh, uncoupled some wagons. Um, that's happened in this section before. It can be quite rough. Roger, thank you. We're going back to investigate. I'll let you know. Guys have to pull the train to a stop now, and then they'll get out and they'll walk the train till they find what the problem is. The major concern is we could have derailed, then another train could come along and run into the wreckage. Yeah, just a uh, hose bag that's come undone, made about six in the front. While the fixing of a loose air hose is simple, now the drivers must pump the air pressure back up. And the air should be coming up. To get this train moving again. OK, mate. This is what we call the hose bag. And this allows the air to go through, the, continuous through the whole train. And with that come apart, all the brakes have come on because all the airs escaped from the train. It's pretty unusual for that to happen, but it can happen. That's pretty lucky, actually, that it's so close to the front. Because as you know, we're 1.6 kilometres long. And uh, Murphy's law is it's normally right at the back. <laughs> but uh, lucky this time. No more excitement. 
Okay, boss. Do you like excitement? Do you want control over on the boat? Then? We do have understood. Thanks, driver. Thanks for all your uh, help with uh, telling us about that. 3MP9 is rolling again. 30 kilometres down, 3,000 kilometres and more than half a continent still to cross. From Melbourne, 3,000 kilometres north to tropical Cairns, where drivers Lee and Will and their Savannah Lander train are struggling through the Karanda Ranges. Their passengers are ready for the ultimate outback adventure, but the train has to make it over the mountains first. And today, that may not be possible. Steady rain is making what's usually a slow run into a constant battle for traction. That greasy track sure is uh, causing a bit of havoc at the moment. Nature's various elements are conspiring against them. Rainforest leaves full of oil have settled on the tracks, add water and a slippery film covers the rails. Greasy tracks and a steep climb are the train's worst enemy. What I'm doing is because I'm staring at my speedo down here, which is, I can see when it starts to, of course, jump up, I can notice that my wheels are spinning. So what I have to do is I have to get off the throttle really quickly allow them to uh, settle back down and then just gently reapply the throttle to hopefully, uh, hopefully get some traction so we can continue up this hill. The passengers have no idea about the struggle Lee's having up front. Uh, yeah, still slipping. You get build up of leaf over, over a period of a couple of weeks. And then, of course, that little bit of rain, like we said before, it just really bad. So it makes it really hard to manage. If we do start to spin, I just quickly jump on this little pedal on my um, right foot down below, and that drops some sand underneath those drive wheels. So um, I've been using that a fair bit this morning. I'd be surprised if there's anything in there. We've got pretty powerful engines in these these days, um, but it still only gets powered through one single axle. So the, the power going to that one axle just, just tends to send it a little bit crazy. But I've been, this is a bit right here where I've been stuck before. Still only halfway up the range and losing momentum on the worst part. At the Carrara mine, George Savell's day has just gone from bad to worse. On top of a closed port that could shut his railway down, one of his loaders has sprung a leak and is out of action. How's you looking there, Dale? Fluid is spilling out from underneath. Uh, I think we just sprung a bit of a coolant leak, so I'm just going to jump up top and have a look. Looks like it might be coming out around the aircon there somewhere. Can I get someone straight down the rail for us? Loader 74's got a coolant leak. A loader down when there's a train waiting to be filled is bad news. George has to keep the operation running at both ends. If the tide changes, they'll start filling the ships and this train will have to go. The huge steel buckets on these machines eat through the 10 metre high stockpile in amazingly quick time. It's fast and furious but it also has to be precise. Every scoop has to be delivered into the rail wagon the right way. The metal bucket can never hit the train. The cars, well, the hoppers only sit on there by a little central pin. That's more the weight bearing down on them that, that holds them there. So, you know, if we make contact with that, there's every chance we could, we could probably knock it off the pin and dislodge it. So we've got to get cranes in and all that, lift it back on. Each load has to be the right weight. So I've got a derby bucket now, this is going to weigh the dirt. And spread the right way. Uh, if, you, if you can't get that right, there's potential of what they call a push-pull effect. Um, so as one's, one wagon's fully loaded and it's pulling it, and the other one's trying to push it, and your light wagon that's inside, there's potential for it, just with the effect that it could lift off the rails.
Two loaders doing the job of three puts more pressure on the drivers. But despite the deadlines, getting the job done right and safely is always more important than getting it done quickly. Fast work by the on-site mechanics gets the loader fixed in just under an hour. Get her back on the run and load this train and send her on its way. The trains continue to run for now. But the port is still closed. The surging high tide has now turned into a super low tide. We've now got low water levels in the harbour off the back of a surge. Uh, you get uh, atmospheric pressure and so on pushes the water down. You get less tide in the harbour than what's expected. If the low water continues, we may have to sail the boat light, and that means dead freight for the company. We'll pay for space on the boat that we haven't used. Stockpiles are continuing to back up on shore. The storage sheds are now close to capacity. Another 7,000 tonnes of ore is the last thing that's needed. If we get any other surge or any other weather events come in, you know, we could have the boat stuck in here again and that'll shut the railway down. Outside Melbourne, SCT Freight Train 3MP9 is on the move again after hitting a bad piece of track. Advice control and they've given us the all clear to keep moving. Despite the unscheduled stop, the train is back running on time. Just before the Victoria-South Australia border, they'll swap crew. A midnight changing of the guard. The next team will need to be fresh for what's ahead. The new driving team is Ricky Graham and Andy Bishop. Ahead of them is one of the toughest stretches of rail track in Australia. We have an eight-hour run from Horsham Adelaide. It'll be a fairly challenging at times. Between them and Adelaide are the Adelaide Hills, 50 kilometres of sharp bends and steep grades. Up and down a fair bit, but then you actually pull the train up towards the, uh, Mount Lofty, which is the top of the, the Adelaide Hills. They're tough work for any train, but for this 1.6 kilometre long monster, weighing over 5,000 tonnes, they can be a nightmare. Sometimes you don't make it, sometimes you stall, unfortunately. And of course, you get up, then you've got to come down. So, uh, yeah, that, that's a challenge too, uh, you're braking comes down to momentum and uh, making sure you hit the bottom of a, of a dip at track speed so that you can keep your momentum up to uh, crest over the top of the hill. And rain is the last thing they need. A good downpour, it can cause hassles with our traction. Before the hills, they have to cross the Murray River on a narrow bridge built nearly a hundred years ago. And that's quite spectacular because you've got no guardrail out of, around part of the actual bridge. As the train slows, it's an eerie experience. On approach, there's nothing between them and the 30 metre drop into the blackness below. They hit the Adelaide Hills. The serious climb has started, and ominously, the rain is back. The rain's getting heavier now. I feel it's slipping a bit more. The train's going around quite a few curves. It creates a lot of drag on the train, so it compounds the, uh, the amount of tonnage we've got. We've got down to 25 kilometres an hour at the moment. Ricky needs to keep the momentum going or risk stalling. I've stalled a couple of times on the hill, actually close to Mount, Mount Lofty. It's a tad embarrassing, but uh, sometimes you can you can restart your train and lift the load again, or sometimes you might have to get um, 
rescued by the cavalry, so they might send out another locomotive and I'll attach to the front and help you pull you over the, over the top. Or a train might have to come from behind and give you a bit of a push up the hill. Yeah, it's dropped under 20 kilometres an hour, so as long as it's still moving. You can feel it actually struggling. So it doesn't like this at the moment. Momentum is everything, but they're slowly losing it. The train speed is dropping fast. Let the loco do its thing and uh, hopefully they keep going forward. The three locomotives are pulling a massive 62 wagons. The wheels are screaming out for more traction. The locomotive's sanding, it's laying sand on the track. So to uh, create a bit more adhesion. If we stop, well then we're in trouble. Port in Geraldton, there's finally some good news for rail manager George Savell. The tide has turned and there's now enough water to support the loading of the Illawarra Fortune. At the moment we're going to fill the boat to its capacity. 70,000 tonnes have to be loaded before the next high tide, when this ship is due to sail. That will be more than $5 million worth sitting in these holds. We think we'll get out Friday morning. We think we'll be able to keep the railway running. But there's also bad news. With another 100 wagons of iron ore magnetite heading towards the port, there's a problem with the unloading machinery. All emptying of the trains has stopped. Supervisor Mark Horn has a warning message on his screen. Tipping can't go ahead. Those two green lines, if they're not up, the wagon's not in position. He'll have to find a way to nudge the car into alignment. Go into manual and uh, just bump it forward. Oh, I know. It's still not right. It seemed to have a fault in the position, it doesn't want to come down. They've started to load the ship. The huge stockpile is disappearing. There are other ships that also have to be filled. And if Mark can't get his loading problem fixed soon, they'll run out of ore. On the Savannah Lander, Lee is still struggling with wheels slipping in the wet. The motor on their vintage train is working overtime, straining up the steep grades. It's a grind on wet tracks. Lee has been manually laying sand. The sand being uh, blasted by air underneath that, the wheel trying to get traction. So the sand is just like grip. So it gets it under there and it crushes the sand down and creates something for it to stick to. Rather of being just steel to steel, it gives it a, a little bit of a, um, a bit of grip. And it's doing the trick. The track in front starts to flatten. At last, he's getting full traction, picking up speed. Soon, the train they call the Silver Bullet is firing again. But with speed comes danger. The Savannah Lander is a once a week service. Car drivers forget that it runs. It's the last thing people expect to see. You really are just dicing with death. Certainly don't stop on a five cent piece. Um, if you do drive out in front of us, we put the emergency brakes on, but the, the wheels most times lock up and they just start sliding. You're still doing 40, 50, 60 k's an hour.
At the next town, Will has an important job to do. I'll get it. <laughs> From here on, there are no electronic signals. It's too remote. Instead, a primitive rail safety procedure from the 1830s is still used. Once we get to this point, things get pretty old school. Next to his mobile phone sits a more basic way to communicate, the wooden staff. You run a relay, you carry a baton, and then you, you pass that baton on as you go. And we need the baton or staff to use that, that piece of track. So that says Machuba Armadin. As long as we've got this, we know that there's no other trains on the line anywhere between Machuba and Armadin because they would have to have this in order to be there. With this piece of wood on board allowing him to travel, holder of the baton, Will, gets the Savannah Lander underway, knowing for sure that his train is the only one on the track, which is just as well as Will spots something that makes him stop. I just saw something, I just want to double check. Will started out life as a zookeeper, which comes in handy on a bush train. Uh, looks like there's a little fruit bat, a little red flying fox just caught on the barbed wire fence on the left hand side. And you know, yeah, I know a lot of people think they're a pest, but having a long drawn out death in the sun, no, no animal deserves that. There's a good reason most people would leave this helpless animal to its fate. Some Australian bats carry a deadly virus that can make a simple scratch fatal to humans. But Will isn't going to let this little fella suffer. So the important thing with these is if you're not immunised, don't touch them. Like Will, you're only protected if you've had a common rabies vaccination. It gets almost impossible to untangle the poor little fellas. But if the hole's not too big, and there's no skeletal damage, then it shouldn't take too much at all. Luckily for the new passenger, help is just down the track. At the next stop. So a, uh, a friend of mine, um, Marjorie, she's a wildlife carer just over at the post office that she runs. Will and Lee hand the fruit bat over to the postmistress. I, I don't think the hole in his wing's too bad. Hello, darling. Her shop sometimes doubles as an animal shelter. Oh, yes, I won't disturb him. Marjorie has just the right packaging for her feisty new friend. Don't fly out. Right, stay in there. There you go. Um, done. Thank you, Marjorie. That's all right. Soon the Savannah Lander is back on its way. Still more than a day away from its destination. The passengers already have a story to tell about the day they rode through the outback in the Batmobile. At the Carrara loading facility in Geraldton, George Savell has a new problem holding up his multi-million dollar supply line. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's just, just off, isn't it? Yeah. The tippers that empty the ore trains aren't working. In the control room, operator Mark Horn is trying to find out what's wrong. Lowering clamps. His computer alerted him to the problem. Now it needs human intervention. It seemed to have a fault in the position that doesn't want to come down. So I'll probably call off a sparky and get him to save me. Disruptions like these can stop the trains and the filling of the ships. There's one parked offshore, the Galaxy, patiently waiting its turn. Delays are hugely expensive. Yeah, give me a minute, I got the uh, wagon not in position. This fault needs to be fixed, and fixed fast. My um, position arm won't go down. Can you have a look and see what I'm doing wrong? Yeah, right, right. I'm looking for the, uh, the alignment of the plan. So 
the things that hold the train down when it doesn't tip. These super efficient machines can empty this train in less than two hours. But when something goes wrong, technology can be your enemy. It has its little glitches, it has its moments, I think. The technician can't find anything that's obviously wrong. That leaves the computer as the likely culprit. It is. I think I've got it. After all the drama. Are you all good to go or are you still waiting? Roger, mate. Cheers. All it takes is a simple mouse click to get the multi-million dollar unloading operation up and running again. Copy. Piers and Teenies have finally got all heading towards the shed. Yeah, cheers, Spitzel. Crisis over. Good news. George has managed to keep the trains running. We'll get the Illawarra out to sea and we'll bring the Galaxy in and, and maintain continuous operations. The wagon's tipping and the ship's sailing. JJ signed off. We're ready well, to go. Mate. Good work. Perth bound 3MP9 is struggling through the punishing grades of the Adelaide Hills. Steady rain making its fight for traction even harder. A bit of rain around at the moment, so the track's fairly greasy. Despite having three locomotives at full throttle, it's slow going. At times on this notorious climb, the train speed has dropped to below 10 kilometres an hour. So it's a lot of balance between the train dynamics to control the train speed. But driver Ricky Graham has managed to keep momentum. Not much, but enough to suggest he's winning the battle with the mountain. There's one last climb before they're out of trouble. One last push to the top. It's a snail's pace, but at least they're moving. And then down the other side, down through Belair and down through to uh, Adelaide. Adelaide's outer suburban stations are a welcome sight as 3MP9 picks up speed heading into the South Australian capital. Another welcome sight is the rising sun. It's been a long night, but this train still has a long way to go. The next leg of its journey is a 2,000 kilometre slog across the infamous Nullarbor Plain. It gives you appreciation of just how big and wide Australia is and how much nothing there can be out there. And the desert will have its own unique dangers waiting for them. Railroad Australia, a 13,000 horsepower super train. That's what lies ahead of us, the mountains. Up against the mountain range from hell. We get paid big bucks for this one. Danger on the tracks. Oh, here we go. How do you stop a 5,000 tonne juggernaut? Farmers moving a whole herd of sheep over the track and we've come along with 110 and wiped out half his third. And the outback heroes. Oh. With train troubles. Main air pressure's dropping up and down a little bit. And a showdown with one of the locals. Early morning at the Port Botany Docks in Sydney. The last containers are coming off a freight train that arrived overnight, bringing thousands of tonnes of produce from inland New South Wales. The minute the last container is off, the race is on to get the train ready for the difficult return journey. From the Sydney docks, up and over the Great Dividing Range, to its home depot in Dubbo, 500 kilometres away. The name stamped on the train belongs to this man, Roger Fletcher. 
He used to lease trains to pick up containers from his sheep farm and freight depot. But a year ago, took the plunge and bought his own locomotives. A multi-million dollar punt he hopes will pay off. We're a family company that started from scratch. I only started with a couple of thousand sheep on the road and we just built the thing up. We're not a multinational, but we try and keep control of what we got. His workers are racing to fill containers with bulk meat, wheat, cotton seed and other produce to sell to the world market. It has to be done before the train arrives from Sydney. But lying between the train and the depot are these. The spectacular Blue Mountains are known for their wild beauty. But for trains, they're a killer. Some of the steepest grades and sharpest curves in the country. Lose an engine on the relentless mountain climb and you're in trouble. It will take three locomotives, each with more than 4,000 horsepower to do the job. If things go wrong with these things, it uh, normally makes a big mess. Shunt driver John O'Tiernan... I'm just checking the compressor oil. ..has to make sure they're fit and ready for action. These trains here go a long distance, hauling heavy loads, so, um, yeah, we check these every day. It's all good. Looking good there, mate. Three wagons going now, mate. Three. Roger. Ready to go. After the engine check, Jono and his shunting partner, Andrew Brick, known as Bricky, have to put the train together. Three metres. Just the one metre. And red light. Right, mate. That's red light there. Three step protection in place. Shunting is one of the most dangerous operations on the railway. Those locomotives weigh 134 tonne each. Keep it coming, Jono. If something does roll away, it goes wrong because you've turned a blind eye to something or not follow through on all safety aspects, yeah, fatalities do happen. Air brakes have to be disconnected. It has a lot of uh, air pressure in it. And if you just unhook it, it flies everywhere, takes your shins out, anything else, knees, stuff you really do need. Right, mate, you're away. Fantastic. Jono and Bricky have assembled a whopping 62 wagon train. That's over one and a half kilometres in length. Now it's time to take on the mountain. From Sydney, down to Adelaide, where a freight train is about to trek over two and a half thousand kilometres across the continent to Perth. Transcontinental freighter 3MP9 started its journey in Melbourne, headed west to Adelaide, and will now cross the great wilderness of the Nullarbor Plain to the Western Australian capital. Nice day for it. And, uh, yeah, well, hopefully we get there in two and a half days. Cookie is one of four drivers. For the next 32 hours, he and the others will live and work on the train. When they're not up front in the loco, home is the crew car, where they eat and sleep. This is the box. Uh, we carry all our stuff in, like, just for, uh, for the trip. We're pretty good cooks, aren't we? Yeah, we're fantastic cooks. Yeah. Quietly. Don't, don't tell our wives. Yeah, don't tell our wives. <laughs> On this mammoth 5,000 kilometre round trip, they're going to need to carry their own fuel and lots of it. About 52 to 53,000 litres of fuel. There are no bridges, tunnels, or roads where they're going. So the train can be double sized upwards. Containers stacked on top of each other like Lego. At six metres high, these boxcars are some of the biggest in the world. 
they're twice the size of an average box car. They're the same length, they're just at twice the height so that they can get twice as much. You get 72 pallets in there. The double decking operation is fast and efficient. The locomotives and wagons on this train are worth $25 million. The cargo, another $2 million. That's a lot of money. And there's a tight deadline for loading. We have a window of three hours to turn it around to get it out. The last wagons of 3MP9 are ready to be shunted onto the rest of the train. By the time it makes its mega journey across the Nullarbor, it will be towing 72 wagons, a train that measures nearly 1.8 kilometres, the equivalent of 18 football pitches, double stacked, loaded to the maximum with food and other vital supplies for the distant city of Perth. We'll do an air test and then we'll uh, continue on to Perth. 3MP9 has been loaded on schedule and is on its way. It's a good start to a tough journey. Yeah, bang on time. But on this route, with two and a half thousand kilometres of desert wilderness ahead, anything can happen. Heading north to Almaden, 170 kilometres inland from Cairns, where the Savannah Lander is on day two of a four-day trip to the old gold mining town of Forsyth on a unique journey that's always full of surprises. Drivers Will and Lee have already conquered a tropical mountain range in the rain, stopped to rescue an injured fruit bat, and had a near miss with a motorist. Welcome aboard the Savannah Lander, all those who just joined us, and welcome back to our regular South passengers. <laughs> The Savannah Lander and its passengers have spent the night in sleepy Almaden, a dusty one hotel town that still relies on this weekly service. <coughs> the train is old and the tracks it's travelling on even older. The whole railway line was built to a really, really minimal standard. Whatever the least amount of work that they could get away with is what they went with. The rails on this century-old line are light and uneven. You can visually sight down it that you know one's higher than the other and there's, there's little kicks and dips in it all over the place. The terrain is hard and unforgiving. If there's a sign of trouble, now is the time to find it. If you're looking underneath, just if you see anything bright, shiny and silver, that's probably something that's wrong. So you can look underneath. If everything's black and dirty, uh, everything's where it's supposed to be. It's an all clear for the 1960s train they call the Silver Bullet. Bullet! It's time for this Outback Classic to hit the rails. For Lee, it's going to be a tough day at the controls, but he wouldn't swap this job for anything. I mean, I've been doing this now for eight years, and it's still different. Say good day to everyone in the morning and head off. It's good. I really like it. It's not long before the Savannah Lander hits the worst section of track. Lee's prediction of a rough ride is spot on. In this rugged country, there could be anything on the tracks. A spotter car that can drive on rails has been sent on ahead, looking for danger. He left Mount Surprise this morning pretty early, and he'll make his way across all the way to Forsyth. Um, and what he's doing is he's just checking, making sure there's no trees down, making sure there's no large rocks or landslides in the area. You can check for rocks and landslides out here but you can't predict the wildlife. Well, to your right. The Blue Mountains, rising from sea level to more than 1,000 metres. It's a tough place to put a railway line. But train drivers Simon Briggs and Mick Grantham have taken them on many times before. 
And that's what lies ahead of us, the mountains. With 1.2 kilometres of train dragging behind, these mountains are a huge test of man and machine. It will be a long and slow battle, more than 100 kilometres of winding track ahead. Some of the steepest grades trains this long can manage. We've started the climb. When we get to valley heights, the grade stiffens again, so it'll get steeper again. The engines are working a bit harder now. We're starting to wash off some of our speed. So we're currently in uh, notch eight, which is full throttle. And uh, we're doing 51 k's an hour, but de-accelerating at eight k's an hour a minute. So yeah, it's, it's a fairly steep climb up here for a little bit. Ahead is the first of a series of tunnels that help cut a path through the rocky terrain. The train's horn has to be sounded before they hit the darkness. A vital warning to workers who may be on the line. The tunnels are more than 100 years old, dark and damp. So one of the nicknames for them was the rat holes because it was like going in and out of a whole heap of little burrows. With visibility low, Simon and Mick have to be especially vigilant. One down. Nine to go. <laughs> the train is now deep into the range. It will take a punishing hour to break the back of the mountain pass. An hour at full throttle maximum pull. The three locos combined 13,000 horsepower is fully engaged as the train grinds its way to the summit. If it loses momentum here, it could be dragged down to stalling speed. Stop now and getting this monster started again will be a nightmare. from just west of Sydney down to South Australia, where freight train 3MP9 has left Adelaide and is snaking its way westward, bound for Perth, which is still two days away. With Cookie at the controls, slowly building the huge train up to its top speed of 110 kilometres per hour. After extra wagons were added for the Nullarbor crossing, it's now a colossal 1.8 kilometres long, weighing 5,000 tonnes. A giant of a train. Cookie's pushing it to maximum throttle when he gets a warning from train control. Yeah, 3MP9, um, 9112, just put in a man break creek. I've just reported there's a herd of sheep, quite a few of them. Um, it's a farmer moving a herd of sheep um, and he hasn't advised control so he doesn't know that we're coming, he doesn't know there's any trains in the area uh, and a train we're crossing has reported it so we just need to show a bit of caution. On a train this size going this speed, stopping isn't an option. We've hit sheep before with that instance. Farmers moving a whole herd of sheep over the track, and we've come along to 110 and wiped out half his herd. So, yeah, it's a little bit dangerous. Animals on the track are a common problem out here. There we go. Drivers have to deal with them nearly every shift. Cookie and Ryan passed the train that warned them about the sheep on the track. Cookies already dropped their speed down to under 70. But if the farmer hasn't got his sheep off the line by now, things could get messy. If we see him, hopefully be able to slow down before we hit him. The Savannah Lander is carving its way across the grasslands of the North Queensland outback, sharing the rails with the local wildlife. Well, to your right, 
It's when their fur touches the train and it starts getting close. Both Will and Lee used to be zookeepers. Wildlife is a, it's a huge part of my life. It's a passion, something that um, I've just had forever. I still get to talk about wildlife and educate a lot of the people on the train about it. It's just in this sense, the wildlife is out there. A few common, well, two common wallaroos on the right-hand side. There's time for one final close encounter. This time with humans. Before the Savannah Lander pulls into its destination of Forsyth. We leave here at 8.30 in the morning. So be over here before then. It'll stay overnight here. But before it does, there's a local tradition that has to be observed. Yeah, we're going to have a ride on the train. <laughs> of course, we're going to let them come for a little bit of a, a trip around the angle with us. It only takes five, ten minutes max. Hey, who's that? Uh, but they love it. They're here every week. <laughs> yeah. Gives them something to look forward to. Time to rest up ahead of its 400 kilometre return journey. I'm heading back to Cairns. Take us two days to get there. Um, overnight tonight, man, surprise. It's a small train with a big reputation. And you're never too old to take a ride. Oh, what's on me? Yeah. Savannah Lander. Yeah. We've been dying to get on it. Dying to get on it? Oh, <laughs> Where's a bit of bloody wood for me to knock on? <laughs> Things could get interesting, you'll see. She's 95 years old, not bad. Yeah, well. It may be the home run. But Lee and Will won't be coasting. Up ahead is one of the train's trickiest climbs. What we're doing is we're climbing out of Forsyth up the Newcastle Range, which is our highest point of the Savannah Lander trip. We do have a common wallaroo on the bridge. There he goes. Yeah, he's out of there. Hey, this part here is known as High Bridge, funnily enough. It's a little uncommon for us to have bridges this high out this far west. Most of the bridges that we're going to go over are quite low. These timber bridges are made from local trees felled more than 100 years ago. They're still standing strong, but need to be inspected every year for termites, which could weaken them. They're sturdy and stable, but Lee's taking no chances. It's a long way down to the rocks. From North Queensland, down to west of Sydney. Where the Fletcher's freight train has finally climbed to the top of the Blue Mountains and is changing crews for the last leg of the journey inland. Waiting to take over is veteran driver Bernie Baker and his partner, Anthony Kearse. <laughs> Morning. Morning. How are you, brother? Hey, good man. Had two on the last. She's bunched up. Brakes are just releasing now, so it should be sweet. Bernie's a legend among the crews. He doesn't just drive trains, he collects them. And today, Mick has a present for him. Yeah, oh, cool. Oh, beautiful. I've been hanging out for that. Beauty, thanks, Mickey. See you, mate. Beautiful. It's a miniature of one of the other trains Bernie drives. Another one for his collection. Heading back to Dubbo. The nice little healthy 62 wagon empty container train. People coming out the wave. Bernie's a self-confessed train nut. <laughs> and has been since he can remember. All I wanted to do was finish school. 
so I could join the railways. Uh, I was in my blood, see, because Dad was a driver. There. Some more photographers. Bernie's own train spotting adventures nearly cost him his life, trying to photograph a train from what he thought was a telephone pole. I monkeyed up the pole like I always done. I stuck my neck up between the wires and got electrocuted. Spent two months in a coma and blew the leg off. So I lost, uh, lost my right leg there, below knee. Yeah, woke up out of a coma, one sock too many. <laughs> What kind of a nut job chases trains and takes photos of it? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> the train is due to make it back to base in Dubbo late this evening to pick up thousands of tonnes of freight for the return journey. But at the Fletcher's home depot, 200 kilometres away... Hey, I've uh, just got a major breakdown, mate. Mmm, on my cotton packer. Things aren't running so smoothly. Operations manager Sean Magnuson has lost one of his conveyor belts that load the containers. We had a bit of a break in the um, end roller. The stub axles broke, torn off. Thanks, mate. This consignment of cotton seed has to be packed and locked into containers by the time Bernie's train arrives the train can't be held up. These containers have to get to the docks in Sydney on time. We're, well, we're loading about 75 containers today in total. We've already got uh, about 120 already packed. If they're late, the ships will sail without them. I'll just sit it inside here. Yeah. We'll make a new shaft and put new bearings on it and hopefully weld it all back together again and going by Nine o'clock, hopefully. Bernie's train is on its way, due to arrive in a few hours. If Sean can't fix the conveyor belt in time, this cotton seed won't be going anywhere. The drivers of 3MP9, Cookie and Ryan, have been warned there could be a flock of sheep on the line. You think if there was going to be any, they would have been at that level crossing back there? Yeah, that's what I would have thought. They've been scanning the horizon for signs of trouble, but can see nothing. There's some out in the paddock here, but I can't see any around the track. We've just gone past the 49, so let me obviously move them. So we should be all right to pick up speed and go back to normal. Oh yeah, control, we've just gone past about the 50 kilometer mark and there's no sign of any sheep um, out here, so yeah, she's all clear. Cookie and Ryan's shift in the driving cabin is about to end. We've done well. We haven't hit anything. It's looking good. In each eight-hour shift, the Locos will travel more than 600 kilometres and burn through 6,000 litres of diesel. All right. Take it easy, boys. Having the driver relay means these trains can go virtually non-stop across the desert country. I'll drive for four hours and then Darren will take over for the next four this train is heading into one of the loneliest places on Earth. Not many people out here, for sure. Occasionally you see a few campers and uh, a few four-wheel drivers, but not much else. Drivers joke about it being UFO country. But not long ago, the new driver, Phil, had an encounter that wasn't so funny. About midnight one night, and we went across through a... Um, a cattle grate, and next thing a big light shone down from above us, lit up the whole area right across outside, the whole locomotive, and then it was gone. It was only there for a split second. It was almost like a helicopter light, but we looked out the window and there was no helicopters or anything. I don't believe in UFOs. No, I can't explain what that was, so... <laughs> it was an unidentified flying object. I keep it to myself. People think I'm nuts.
just over the Blue Mountains west of Sydney, the good run of Fletcher's drivers, Bernie and Anthony, has come to an end. Track controllers are holding them in a siding to make way for a passenger train to pass them on the single track section of the line. XBT. That's him now, just leaving Blaney now. Ooh. Time to break out the afternoon scones. This is great. <laughs> I've been on a diet until today, can you believe it? Crawling through the rolling hills again, Bernie gets to admire the full length of his 1.2 kilometre train. I'll see if I can get a look at the back of it. Oh, yeah. Back of the good. Very colourful, all those boxes, isn't it? Things aren't so relaxed at the Fletcher's depot in Dubbo. I've got it, mate. I've got it. Yeah, right, mate. We'll have it over at the workshop. Where operations manager Sean Magnuson is trying to get a broken cotton packing machine together again. If the conveyor belt isn't fixed in time, there'll be five less containers, holding 120 tonnes, nearly $40,000 of cotton seed bound for China that won't make it. But we'll take this over to the workshop. Are you right for the minute to do that? As night falls, the repair job continues. The pressure's on to fix the conveyor belt. The Savannah Lander is cruising towards its next stop. But Lee's gauges are telling him he has a problem. So I'm just noticing that the main, main air pressure is going between 100 and 125. It, it's uh, just dropping up and down a little bit as we're getting along. Air pressure is what powers the brakes. Lose it and the brakes will automatically lock on. And so I was just wondering if we could hear any air leaking out anywhere. What tends to happen, when you come up out of Forsyth, you've got a lot of really tight curves and can put a lot of um, pressure between the two units. Will gets the job to check it out. Can you go stand in between? Can you tell me if you can hear like one of the hoses leaking? but it may not be the air. When you throttle, it doesn't amplify or anything. If you want to pull up and have a look at it, you can. Yeah, I might. The Savannah Lander makes its first unscheduled stop. Neither driver wants to take a risk out here. Uh, Lee's just got to go and check a, a hose pipe. There's just a little abnormality. There are no mechanics to call on. It's a problem they'll have to fix themselves. You can sort of hear a little hiss. Melbourne to Perth freighter 3MP9 is about to enter one of the world's biggest wildernesses. This is one of the last electronic signals its drivers will see. Yeah, because of the remoteness, there's no power out here to run signals. We're going to go underneath the Stewart Highway, which goes to Alice Springs. So once we go under that, that's the last major road we'll see until we get to about Kalgoorlie, which is uh, another 1,400 kilometres away. It's a single line for the next 1,000 kilometres, and it has to be shared. You'll uh, end up doing a double layer at Cold Hannaby, the MP7's right up um, MP9's clacker. The only place these super trains can pass is in sidings, just long enough to fit a 1.8 kilometre train. They're called crossing loops, and out here they serve another purpose. Drivers use them to check each other's trains for problems as they pass. You might see a door open or some ropes hanging down or something like that. 
After the crossing, it's time for a late night crew change in the middle of nowhere. Cookie and Ryan will do the graveyard shift. This next leg is unique. Ahead of them is the longest straight stretch of railway line in the world. We'll keep our maximum speed at 110. There'll be a few little dips and uh, little ups and downs, but other than that, it's just a straight track. 478 kilometres of dead straight track. On the other side of the continent, in New South Wales. When you hit him, you bang, you say you're hard. Bernie and his driving partner are looking out for stray animals that could wander onto the tracks at any time. Look out. Where's his mate? Uh, rock wallaby. Oh, sheep are the worst. They go underneath. They get tangled around all the traction motors, you know, that are on the axles, and they start to cook. Lucky for them, there's something cooking in the cab that smells good. Bernie's diet's about to take another hit. <laughs> In his perfect job, with the perfect dinner, it's moments like these Bernie relishes. Have a look at that, Anthony. Right. We get paid big bucks for this. Bernie may be enjoying the ride, but at the depot, operations manager Sean Magnuson and his team are still frantically trying to fix the cotton loader. It's been down for four hours. They've managed to rebuild a broken shaft, but they need to fit it and get it working before Bernie's train arrives. Holding there, holding there. It's been a tense race. Back him out and see if we can get him started. But when Sean fires up the loader again... Oh, up and running. It looks like they've won. Sweet ass, boys. Finally, they can load up the remaining cotton seed to make the next train out. So this box is now packed. We should be OK, you know, work together as one and we'll be right, we'll get it through. After a 500 kilometre journey up and over a notorious mountain range, Bernie's train has made it safely to the depot on time, ready to be loaded for a quick return to the docks tomorrow. It's been a long day. Shut them down, tie her up and go home. <laughs> but train lover Bernie can't wait to do it all over again. It is a bloody good job. It is really, really a good job. Deep in the outback, the Savannah Lander is still out of action. Lee is trying to find out why he has lost air pressure. You can sort of hear a little hiss. He hopes the culprit is a loose air hose. Just that's what you get to is a lot of, I don't know whether you can see, a little of dust builds up in the seals. So um, every now and then that sort of creates a bit of an issue. So you just get in, clean it out. It's hot, dusty work. But eventually, Lee discovers what's wrong. A latch that keeps the back door closed has been malfunctioning. There we go. It's powered by the train's air pressure system and is the reason for the unusual readings on his gauges. The back door wasn't quite latched. So, um, yeah, the little, little trip switch that goes on that 
just letting go every now and then. And the Savannah Lander is soon back on track. Yeah, this is uh, Mount Surprise. Now, we've been told there's about 70-odd people that live here, but Lee and I have only ever met six. The passengers will stay the night in the local yeah. hotel, but Will and Lee have an after-work engagement. So, yeah, I mean, we were always happy to do something a, a bit different um, when the train pulls up. Out here, Will and Lee can always rely on an invitation for a get-together. But tonight's gathering down by the creek isn't what they expected. There's dogs on chairs. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> well, I figured we were coming out to help Doug do some, some sort of mustering or something like that. He's, he's pretty loose with his terms across the telephone. But uh, we got out here and he's, he's got some, some good friends of his uh, that are visiting. They've been sitting on the chair for 20 minutes. While cattle dogs on chairs might be a laugh, <laughs> what's lurking in a water trough is not. <laughs> Must have jumped in there out of the creek. Yeah, I've seen them in here from time to time, but... <laughs> After going non-stop through the night, Cookie and Ryan are across the Nullarbor, but still a day away from their destination of Perth. So far we've travelled about 750 k's, um, so during the night, which is a pretty good effort. Cookie has a present for the drivers of a train in a siding waiting for him to pass. Yeah, mate, um... Just past the location ahead sign. Do you want a paper? Yeah, we'll take paper next time. No. Yesterday's newspaper. It's not a very good roll up, but that'll do for them. If they want a paper, we'll throw one out. Hey, have a good trip, fellas. Twelve hours later, after running almost non-stop for two days, the train is back to civilization, having crossed the continent. Well, we've nearly travelled two and a half thousand k's, so yeah, we're looking forward to having a rest in a bed that doesn't move, and uh, yeah, we'll have a have a nice shower and rest up for the way back. I'm very tired. Looking forward to getting off. Behind the locos. 72 fully laden wagons that have been hauled across the country. To do the same by road would take more than 100 trucks. Yeah, 5,664 tonnes of train from Melbourne to Perth arrived safely at Forestfield uh, Depot. Melbourne to Perth, more than 3,000 kilometres. The end of one of the world's longest train journeys. That's it, shut them down and we'll go home. While the Savannah Lander is safely parked up for the night in Mount Surprise, Will. its drivers Will and Lee are risking it with one of the locals <laughs> at a nearby cattle station. The freshwater crocodile is trapped in a water trough. We'll get a rag or a something to throw on his head. You're going to bounce. Freshwater crocs may be smaller than their saltwater cousins, but they can still pack a punch. <laughs> Thank goodness there are train drivers around. You got that part? Yeah, man. If I come around your way, so you can get out, or you come out, I'll go in, you go out. Look at that. Where's the deepest part of the creek here? Down there, eh? Probably. That way?
He looks all right. Nice one. So, if you want to pull the back off first, you're right. Yeah. Go on. Go on. Go, 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 go. On this unique outback train, its drivers and passengers have crossed a mountain range. Saved a fruit bat, given way to a kangaroo on a bridge crossing, and rescued a croc. And their journey is far from over. Railroad Australia. Fields of fire. The heat is on. There is a, a, a lot of pressure. To get sugar cane to the mill. And things can go wrong. That's why we've got to be on our game. Oh. A missing train. Where it exactly is at the minute, do you know? They're waiting to load and could miss the boat. You've got a port window and that's what you've got to stick to. Yeah, I can't have him blocked. This train's got to go out this afternoon. And an intruder on the tracks. Hey, Will. Will? Yeah. Stops an outback adventurer. In the sugar fields of far north Queensland, farmers are setting fire to their crop. A burn-off to get rid of excess vegetation known as trash, leaving only the tough, flame-resistant stalk rich in sugar to be harvested. As the fire rages across one field, in another, cane driver Ray Stinger Giles and his offsider Michael McNeil are hauling bins of freshly cut cane to the mill. Well, it's walking keeps you fit, eh? They haven't found an easier way, obviously. I've got a 40-ton loco with a brake band on the back. You've got about 1,600 ton behind you. So that's a lot of weight, and you've got to know what you're doing and, and when you've got to do it. Sugar is a $2 billion industry in these parts. It is a really constant battle making sure that the trains are on time and keeping them going out so the whole factory can keep on going. An entire region depends on drivers like Stinger. Getting the crop from the fields to the factory as fast as possible. The longer it stays burnt without sending to the mill and getting crushed, the lower the sugar content of the cane, the less money we get. The ticking clock piles the pressure on Stinger and his fellow drivers. He's returned this load early, but tomorrow's another day. It's a great relief, really, to, to go all that way up there and get back before the end of our shift. Tomorrow's trip will be the toughest. Setting out from the sugar mill at Garoo near Townsville, travelling 100 kilometres south to Millaroo and return collecting from one of the remotest farms. The lines through the fields are rough and basic. They have a 200 kilometre round trip. The sky today is clear, but the forecast for tomorrow is for fog. Stinger and Michael are in for a tough day. Heading northwest, to the old gold mining haunts of the early pioneers, where one of the great characters of Australian rail, the Savannah Lander, is halfway through a four day journey deep into the outback. After travelling from Cairns to the old gold mining outpost of Forsyth, 
drivers Will Kemp and Lee Johns are setting out on the return leg, back to the coast. It's all about just making time today. A 10 hour run ahead of them. All that looking at pretty scenery and stopping at creeks and all that sort of thing, nah, sorry, can't do it. They have a strict deadline to get back to home base in Cairns. But before they set off, Will needs to go shopping for what could be the most important purchase of his life. Hey, uh, <laughs> just at the um, little gem dealership in Mount Surprise. My girlfriend, partner, whatever you want to call it. I've been with her for about seven years now, and, you know, it's time to, to step up to the plate and that sort of stuff. OK. Gorgeous. Isn't it just? It's fantastic. Just hopefully she hasn't changed her mind from any previous agreements. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a long journey and a lot of work to be done before he gets to make his proposal. Big day today. It's the last day. It's the most tiring. It sometimes can be a, a very trying day. Good morning, everyone. G'day. Welcome aboard. Lee is up front for the start of the long haul. 400 kilometres back to Cairns. But keeping the Savannah Lander running on schedule isn't easy. The tracks are unfenced and the cattle are willful and unpredictable. Pushing some cattle up the line here, but down over on the right hand side, you can see why they're hanging around down here. There's a creek. They're not the brightest animals. If you've got 50 of them on the, le on the left and you've got five on the right, you know the five on the right are going to go to the left. So it, they, we tend to miss them. But, um, yeah, it's not, un not uncommon to have them right up against the front of the train as you're cruising along. The last thing Will wants is a holder. Or even worse, a damaged train that can't make it back. Yep, there we go, thought so. Going across onto the right. After crawling through the cattle, Lee hits the throttle. But even in cruise mode, his eyes are trained on the track. He's done this run enough times to expect the unexpected. Suddenly, he spots something on the tracks. Hey, Will, Will, you're up. Lee hits the brakes. He fears he's run something over. Just gone past it. It's probably behind us, hopefully it didn't move. Will has to race back to investigate. West of Cairns, 2,000 kilometres south to Dubbo, New South Wales. Where crews at the Fletcher's freight depot are working flat out to get a train loaded and moving in just a few hours. The train is due to depart Dubbo for a 500 kilometre trip east to the port in Sydney. These containers have to be full and on the train by early afternoon for an overnight journey to port. We've got to be away by 2.30 today, so we get back into port for a six o'clock window in the morning. Trouble is, the train they're supposed to be loading hasn't arrived. Operations manager Sean Magnuson is trying to find out why not. Throw our train on the GPS where it exactly is at the minute, do you know? The news from train control isn't good. We've got our train, which is only about six k's out of town here, and we've got an ore train. Track control could give the coal train priority. What happens is that um, Broadmeadow might let him go through first, and then we'll have an hour and a half wait. Sean can't afford to lose 90 minutes of precious loading time. Yeah, I can't have him blocked. This train's got to go out this afternoon. The three Fletcher's locomotives waiting just down the track are towing empty containers. But when the train gets to the Fletcher's depot, they have to be taken off before full containers with meat, cotton and wheat can replace them. He's going to lock us away, is he? If Sean can't negotiate a green light for his train... How long are we going to be blocked for? He's looking at expensive delays. It's costly. 
we have to truck boxes into the port, 100 odd boxes at $350 a box. It's, it, it gets a bit exy. The fate of Sean's freight train is in someone else's hands. But this morning, Sean is in luck. Oh, that's all right, mate. Train control gives him the brake he needs and lets the Fletcher's train through first. Now the race is on to assemble a 1.2 kilometre train in just a few hours. Yeah, g'day mate, it's Bernie on um, 8148. How are you Bernie? I'm doing just fine, thank you sir. Veteran driver Bernie Baker is in charge for the first leg. For 4,197 ton. Oh, look at all those 100 ton wagons. All right, we're going to know we're alive tonight then, that's good. It's heavy and long. The three locomotives will be pulling 62 wagons over the Great Dividing Range. 1,100 metres high. Nearly 100 kilometres across. No place for a train this size. In the North Queensland cane fields, a crop is being burned. Now it has to be harvested and transported to the mill quickly before the sugar content starts to drop. Hey, comedy, currently yard for Miller Delbeck. Stinger is one of the drivers who has to make sure this happens. There is a, a, a lot of pressure. But from the time it's, it's harvested till it's crushed, it's quite critical in the sense that uh, the sugar content deteriorates in, in the cane. And things can go wrong. That's why we've got to be on our game so that you can get your run done in a reasonable amount of time. Stinger and his offsider Michael have done their train checks, but a thick fog is rolling in, threatening to bring things to a standstill. You've got to be more aware of what's happening when it, when it is foggy. You've got to give yourself a little bit more room to slow down. Visibility from the train is terrible. Yeah, I can see his headlights. Just. That's a train in front of them, on the same line. Hey, Scrumity, uh, Bradaloop. The siding they're going to isn't visible until the very last moment. But we're going to go off to the right because there's only one line in and out of the mill. And um, if you have a major derailment here, it's going to stop the locos coming from bringing the cane back to the mill and it's stopping the locos delivering the next lot of empty bins to the contractors. So it'll slow the whole process up. After the trains pass, Stinger and Michael continue to nurse their train through the fog. It's probably, uh, probably the worst fog we've had. So visibility would be down to about 20 metres. Yeah. At this speed, their chances of getting to their consignment of cane on time are not looking good. But the fog shows no sign of lifting soon. To make matters worse, ahead are two busy roads. We're just about to cross the Bruce Highway. The train might be going slow this morning, but the traffic isn't. Yeah, uh, fog's pretty thick, eh? Cromley Loco, we're just going to come through Mona Park heading towards Clare, eh? We've just got to make sure that there's no problems going across. Because obviously if we have a derailment on the highway, it's going to stop traffic as well. We can do a lot of damage, not only to um, machinery, but life and limb as well, you know? There are no boom gates on this section of the road, only warning lights. Stinger has the lights on his loco blazing, but the fog is thick and the motorists are in a hurry. The driver spots Stinger's train at the last moment. A close call. Stinger's going to have a nerve-wracking trip if these conditions don't improve soon. From foggy North Queensland to the east coast of New South Wales, 
and the inland centre of Dubbo. And we're right to go. Oh, you ready, Anthony? No, no, mate. The giant Fletcher's meat, wheat and cotton train is loaded and moving. It's 62 wagons long and has a 500 kilometre journey ahead of it. Part of that over the Great Dividing Range, one of the steepest climbs on Australia's railways. As it crawls out of the depot, workers check that all wagons are fit and ready for the difficult job ahead. So they're making sure no handbrakes and that are on, everything's making the noises that it should. No air leaks in the hoses and things like that as well. Say hello to Jimmy. The inland climate on the route Bernie's taking can throw up extreme conditions, sometimes freezing. Yeah, you've got frosty rails and sanders aren't quite working properly. And... Sometimes so hot... The track um, can buckle just because of the heat. Yeah. Bernie's had first-hand experience with track buckle. This scary footage was shot from the cabin of a train he was driving. The loco's wheels came off the track, but Bernie managed to pull up before a full-scale derailment. Incidents like that remind Bernie how important his job is. These logos are worth, what, five, five, five and a half million dollars each? It's just even damaging a loco, you know, their logo's got to be taken out of service, you've got to find a logo to replace that one, so there's higher charges, plus the repairs, all adds up. We get paid for keeping ourselves alive and everyone else alive around us, you know. We're not paid for our good looks, <laughs> which is just as well. <laughs> I'd be broke if I got paid for looks. <laughs> Bernie has a town to get through before this big rig builds up speed for the first serious hill. So we've got uh, what we call Big Kalua. She's pretty steep. It's steep. <laughs> just make sure you have a good run up. <laughs> Here we come! Bernie has the easiest part of the journey. Yeah, just keep powering up, Bernie. Right on, mate. An eight-hour haul to the top of these mountains. It will be night when they get there, and another fresh crew will take over for the difficult descent down the range in the dark. The Savannah Lander has had to make an unscheduled stop in the middle of nowhere. Lee spotted something on the tracks. It's up to Will to check it out. Yeah, right, I'm just running out back now, see it. <laughs> the train ran over the top of a mystery creature. But it may have survived. It's a snake. I don't think you got him anyway. That's the good news. Luckily, Will's an ex-zookeeper who knows his reptiles. So, yeah, this little fellow's just sitting in the middle of the track. It's a little black-headed python. Not venomous, but not a pet either. Lee knows my affection for these guys. Often likes to stop to make sure that he hasn't injured it. And it doesn't look like he has at all. It's fine. All good. All good. Yeah, lovely. That's a baby, yeah. This year's, I'd say. It's up to you on. Oh! Ho, ho, ho! Snap! You got a good heart. Will's girlfriend, who he plans to propose to when he gets back to Cairns, is also a wildlife carer. That's given him an idea. Now, I've asked Mel to come down to Cairns Station tonight when we bring the train in. Uh, I've told her that I actually ran over a snake and I've, I've damaged its tail. 
and that it's, it's going to need veterinary attention. Put the bag down on the ground, reach into it. Inside the bag, there's no snake, of course, but there's a ring. Pull it out, and hopefully it all goes well. Pretty nervous. For now, Will needs to keep his mind on the train and the track in front. There are roads out here that the Savannah Lander has to cross, but no level crossings or warning lights. Nothing to alert a motorist that a train is coming. We dread it. The Burke Development Road crossing. 100 km an hour speed limit. A lot of road trains use it. The only thing we've got protecting ourselves is, of course, a giveaway sign. It's a nervous moment. Big trucks over 40 metres long can do 100 kilometres an hour on this road. Visibility with this crossing too isn't the best until you sort of get right on top of it, so really important to slow it right down and make sure everything's clear before you proceed. After the crossing, they can make good speed. Will's proposal is still on track, but there's one last hold-up he can't avoid. The odd train that came through, they were still, still more than happy to get out and, uh, and rob it. Yes, train robbers, after some easy pocket money. Best thing to do is stay seated. The legend of Ned Kelly, Australia's most famous bush ranger, lives on. People think this is a joke. We had a passenger laugh last week. He got his head blown off. They take anything. They take gold coins. They take five cent pieces. They take Werther's originals. Now that's some of the most irresponsible parenting I've ever bloody seen. In the sugarcane fields, Stinger's train has avoided the traffic but he's still battling through thick fog. Hopefully this fog will lift in an hour or so. They're heading for a cane farm on the edge of the growing area. It's the longest trip of their roster. If anything happens here, if we have a derailment or any uh, hold-up, we have four, four of the locos behind us we won't be able to get out. 70 kilometres down the track on the farm Stinger is trying to get to, the harvest is going full throttle. The sun is blazing and has finally blown away the fog that was hampering operations. Visibility is back to normal, really. You can see for kilometres. Before Stinger and Michael can pick up the cut crop, there are like empty that. bins to drop off at other farms. Let me know when you've hooked up. I'll get you to come back about one bin. All right. Uh, we're going to be dropping 54 uh, empties, head further up where we're picking up some more empties and then going up to 6, dropping off 87 and start picking up from 6, I believe. The track Stinger's train is running on are narrow gauge, just 2 foot or 60 centimetres wide, half the width of regular lines. It makes river crossings like this even more precarious. There is a wind monitor that gives uh, traffic an indication of how fast the wind is, uh, whether or not we can cross or not. It's only 100 feet from, to the bottom, I'd say. Yeah, gives me a thrill every time I go across it. <laughs> Stinger and Michael drop off their last load of empties. Now the train shortens dramatically. It's just loco and brake van. It makes for a cosy and quick run until the next bridge. The combined weight of the loco and the brake van is um, about 80 tonnes. And um, it's not safe to add that combined weight on that one span on the bridge. They have to be uncoupled and make the crossing one at a time. Loco first, and then the brake van, by remote control. The brake van should release automatically when Stinger hits a button in the Loco. 
Uh, the brake van didn't come uncoupled from the loco. But today, it's not going according to plan. Some locos are coupling they catch, whether it's on a corner or it's on a, a lean or whatever. Still attached, it's not coming off. I don't know what we're going to do. After an eight hour, 250 kilometre run through the inland, Bernie Baker's freight train has reached the edge of the Blue Mountains, where there'll be a crew change. Big fella, how's it going? The new drivers will be in charge of getting the train safely down the mountains to the port of Sydney. Five in Sydney? Yeah. Bangers and mash. Man's got to eat. Man's got to eat. <laughs> see you, mate. All right, see you then. Right, okay, ta-da. The trip will demand constant vigilance from drivers Mick Grantham and Simon Briggs in control of three locomotives, holding back the weight of a train more than a kilometre long. Yeah, three engines, three of them, all doing, all working. Um, and we've got um, the four and a half thousand horsepower each. They'll be descending more than a thousand metres down steep grades with 62 wagons carrying 5,000 tonnes of freight pushing from behind. But before the descent, there's one last climb. We're in full power now going up the zigzag bank, which is a one in 40 gradient, which means that for every 40 metres we go along, it goes up one metre. Steel on steel, you haven't got much friction. Compare that to rubber on a car tyre against bitumen, you've got a lot of grip, but steel on steel, there ain't. The train disappears into the first of a series of century-old tunnels. They built them between 1908 and 1910. There are nine more after they get through this one. So it's one of the places you've got to be a little bit careful with the train. The water drips through the tunnels. You get it on the rails as well. I tend to not come up through in full power anyway. There's a little bit less ask of the wheels on the uh, rails. You can't take it for granted either. I oh, don't take nothing for granted. The next signal just around the corner here is just before the big drop. So that's the start of it, just here. It's all downhill from here. 60 kilometres of hard braking. We're going to take our time. That'll uh, make things simple. That way, if we go a bit slow, then uh, you're not going to burn out your brake shoes. It's pretty much for the next hour, just slow running downhill with the brakes on. These trains have two braking systems. And on a descent this steep, They'll both be working overtime. That's the air brake. The red one's the automatic brake handle, which works the brake shoes on every wheel of the train. The second system is called dynamic braking. The three locos generate electricity, which runs motors that drive the wheels. It works back through the traction motors. The traction motors stop being a motor and they start becoming a generator. To keep the train from running away downhill, the drivers reverse thrust, so the engines are working against the train instead of driving it. You can't just put the brakes on and off willy-nilly. Uh, you've really got to plan your applications out. It's the early hours of the morning, but Mick and Simon are wide awake, guiding this giant through the mountains, keeping its speed constant, the braking just right. They're quite steep. You could best this up fairly easily. The train and drivers work hard on this 60-minute downhill stretch. It's maximum strain. If something's going to break, this is the time. It's so tough on the trains that safety authorities have installed a sophisticated detection unit at the side of the tracks to check nothing's wrong. It picks up hot wheels, it picks up hot bearings. Uh, it's got drag detectors, so if there's something hanging down from the wagon, it'll pick that up as well. And they'll give us what type of alarm it is, um, what they think's wrong, what wagon it's on, what axle number. Will is back at the controls of the Savannah Lander, which is still five hours away from its destination of Cairns. After four days on the train, the afternoon shift is where you've got to be the most alert. It's also the shift where you're probably feeling the most drained, fatigued and ready for a weekend. But his most important task is ahead, proposing to his girlfriend with the engagement ring that's in his pocket. And everywhere he looks, love is in the air.
So he's attracting his female now. Well, it's pretty similar to what we do, isn't it? See a pretty girl you like, jump up and down and carry on like an idiot. <laughs> the train reaches the mountain range outside of Cairns. And that's about as dry as they get in the wet season. Obviously, they flow a lot more. From here, it's a steep and spectacular descent towards the sea through a series of historic tunnels. This is our tunnel number 15, the longest tunnel on the range. Just under 500 metres in length. Six men alone died in the construction of this tunnel. Pretty dangerous work. All done, dynamite, picks and shovels. Wills asked his girlfriend of seven years to meet him at the station. Oh, you need to see the ring. Oh, yeah. He hopes to propose right there on the platform. And to do it, he has a cunning plan. I've wanted to ask her something for a while. And you know that black-headed python that we uh, ran over today? I, I told her I've, we injured it. Uh, so, sweetie, can you please meet me at Cairns Station and, uh, and I'll, I'll give you the black-headed python and you can take it straight home. I'm going to put this ring in the bottom of the snake bag. <laughs> if she says yes, cheer. If she says no, come give me a cuddle because I'm probably going to need it. <laughs> I'm nervous as buggery, eh? <laughs> The Savannah Lander is back in Cairns, and Will is only minutes from proposing to the love of his life. Will's gone on adrenaline and excitement and nerves. Of half a dozen level crossings to go and we'll be safe. She gave him all the right signals. But the same can't be said for traffic control. This is the longest bloody red light I've ever had to wait for. You're going to have to radio. Yeah, I've just got to get on the train control, guys, about this red light, sorry. Oh, yeah, Control, just um, stop short of CS14. We've just got a, a red light there, over. Oh, uh, yeah, there's no warranty on the, uh, the level crossing there. <laughs> this comes down to the, the fact that this rail mode is too light to be detected on the circuitry of, uh, that they've got set up for these level crossings in Cairns. Uh, are they stepped up there, you know? No, sorry, no, still got a red over. Always last level crossing before you knock off on a Saturday. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do. Stinger and his train are on the wrong side of a bridge. Uh, the brake van didn't come uncoupled from the locate. With the brake van so close, he's too heavy to cross. He must uncouple it. If you can't get the brake van uncoupled from the loco, you've got to get the mechanics or the navvies or the boiler makers to come up and do it. It should just be a matter of flicking a switch, but the switch isn't doing its job the brake van won't let go. First go I had at it, I was doing about 10 kilometres an hour and the brake van wouldn't come unhooked. They're on a tight deadline. Stinger has to think on the run. You're not allowed to have the loco and the brake van, which is a combined weight of 80 tonnes or more, on the span at the one time. He hopes if he accelerates quicker, he can jolt it free. this time. But on the next run, his plan works. The loco makes the crossing to the other side. We were lucky we were able to solve the problem there and then and saved a, a lot of inconvenience to a lot of people. Stinger then uses a remote to bring his brake van across. It's the last hurdle. Before Stinger and Mick get to pick up their final bins of sugar cane. Right, are you right to come back? Couple of couplings. Okay, we got them all. It's like a racing car pit stop. Stinger and Michael have to be in and out in the quickest possible time. 
Uh, can we start pulling out? Yeah, you have to keep pulling out. With more than 100 bins in tow, they're back on the move again. But something isn't right. The wheels behind Stinger are screaming out. Oh, he has to take a So we've got down onto the uh, level track. The back of the train's still giving us a bit of a push because we're still coming downhill at the back. But uh, that's just about stopped and it's almost time to put the power back on so that we can keep going forward. The Fletcher's freight train is safely down the mountain, cruising through the Sydney metropolitan system on its way to the port. But the job is far from over. The drivers now have to break the train up to go to different yards. I've got to make sure I cut off at exactly the right spot. If I don't cut off at the right spot, then the wrong wagons end up in the wrong place and it just gets messy from there. It should be routine. That's what we're up to there. Have you got the brakes on, Mick? No. One of them has. There's a deafening sound at the back of the train that's got Simon worried. There's a lot of noise coming from one of the wagons up here. I can hear it coming down the line there. Healthy. And we've been on for a little while too. Yeah, it's definitely something wrong with the brakes. We'll um, see what we can do with it. They have limited time in the shunting yards, so this problem with the brakes needs to be fixed. Mick, can you just give it a full service? Um, once it's fully equalised, then knock them off. Simon asks Mick to pump more air through the system to see if they can unlock the rogue brake set. If that doesn't clear it, I'll cut the wagon out, mate. No drama. Yeah, I pulled the release lever and it went in and it immediately came back out. So there's something wrong with it. With time running short, Simon decides to disconnect the van's brakes altogether. We'll isolate the brakes on this wagon and uh, put some cards on it to say that it's defective. The clock's ticking. The train has to be broken up. They'll have to shunt around the faulty wagon. The solution is fast and brutal. A dramatic end to a difficult journey. It's taken this mega train 500 kilometres from farm to port, across a mountain range, and into the docks on time. Soon, these containers will be on ships, sailing to markets around the world. In Cairns, the Savannah Lander is stuck at a level crossing, waiting for a green light. They've got like this timeout sort of feature. That's sort of like four minutes until it turns, turns itself off. off. It might do it itself and then we clear. Will's proposal will have to wait, like the train. So many signs, Will. You sure you want to do this? <laughs> Uh, five, six, nine, nine, just four minutes, mate. I'll wait a time out and, uh, <laughs> and then try it again. <laughs> four minutes. Right, oh, thanks, mate. <laughs> <sighs> I don't know. It's about an hour too late. Uh, <laughs> we really apologise to the skies. There seems to be some sort of a ghost in the machine. Should, should I get closer? No, I don't have to get closer, do I? No, you're fine. Finally, he gets permission to move on. Yeah. Oh, oh wrong platform. Um, look, there's, I'm really sorry. There's so many signs. They, they've given us the wrong bloody platform. Oh. <laughs> Will's girlfriend could be waiting on the other platform. Or maybe she's given up waiting. 
to see it yet. Then relief as he spots her. Hi, it's in here. Yeah. Oh, a little blackhead. It wasn't here. Oh, yeah, here it is, I know. He's just, he's not, he's not well. Will you marry me? Yeah. <laughs> it's been an eventful ride, one the passengers will never forget. A 400 kilometer trek through the wilds of the outback. It's surprise stops along the way. <laughs> and finally, a platform proposal. I better go and get the luggage off. Okay. <laughs> the end of a journey and the start of a new life. Couldn't have gone any better, I don't think. <laughs> Stinger's cane train is making worrying noises. Oh. They have a train of fully loaded sugar cane bins, but the wheels are screaming. Yeah, um, give us a minute. And this is the culprit. Wheels jammed by a forgotten braking block. Stop block for moving. A plank of wood could have derailed Stinger's day. You all right? Ah, uh, yeah, stop block, we're still in there. Right on. Mikey took off to go and get the ticket, and he didn't pull the stop block yet. We're dragging along a bit. But he's still on track to complete his delivery. Yeah, Stinger, you right to take him out, Stanley. a lot of cane here now, close to 13, 1,400 tonne. That's more than $30,000 worth of cane. Not a bad day's fishing. <laughs> now they have a 100 kilometre trip back to the mill. No stops. Bay Scromedy approaching the yard. As they arrive at the mill, out in the fields, another fire is being lit. In a few hours, Stinger and his cane train will be heading out again. They won't stop until the harvest is over. It's been a good end of the day. Because if we would have been another half an hour later, we would have had to wait all the afternoon shift locos go out. It would be two hours by the time we go back to the mill. Makes me happy. Day's done, eh? So we'll fuel it up and uh, park it up. Railroad Australia. So it'll be all guns blazing shortly. Four hours to fix a faulty track. We've got to be careful, coordinate everything, not get in each other's way. Fail, and it could cost millions. It's an incredibly tight period to do it in. A freight train with fuel problems. And I can actually see the locomotive in fueling mode and then cutting out. I can take power in here. The worst place in the world to run out of juice. And keeping an outback icon on the rails. If something's wrong, it's my head on the chopping block. Introducing the undisputed heavyweight champions of the train world. Australia's giant iron ore cans. 2.8 kilometres long. 38,000 tonnes worth of iron ore. 
They thunder through the iron-rich outback of northwestern Australia, hauling mountains of ore. From the mines of the Pilbara region, 300 kilometers to ships waiting at Port Hedland, bound for China. It's an industry worth billions of dollars, the engine of the nation's economy. Each train would have to have a value of, uh, in the ballpark of three and a half million dollars, four million dollars. So we're talking some serious, serious, serious money. The world's heaviest trains, owned by mining giant Fortescue, take a heavy toll on the track. When the rails need fixing, it means a shutdown. A maintenance shut, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars a minute. It's about to happen. After this last train goes through, a 60-strong team will swing into action. It's imperative there's minimal disruption. Taking advantage of a scheduled maintenance shutdown, they have just four hours to replace a 73-metre section of track, known as a turnout. It's where trains pass each other. Machines that can slice through the heavy steel rail will be needed as well as heavy-duty cranes to lift the new section into place. We'll immediately start cutting the track and then the diggers on that side will start pulling, pulling the turnout down. When they get the go-ahead, it all has to run like clockwork. The diggers will then climb up and they'll start levelling. If it doesn't, the consequences are huge. The numbers stagger. It takes six of these trains to fill a ship with ore that's worth more than $10 million. Three of these ships sail every 24 hours. Yeah, Jim, we're uh, ready to take uh, track access authority. Yeah. A call goes through to train control. And now he's just waiting for the track access authority to generate on the computer. The team has to get official possession of the track before they can get to work. Once we've got all the track down, we've got the got the ballast level, then the crane lift will happen. Authorised the Roger control, that's track access, authority number 0102. This is it, now we've got the possession now, so we start our time now, and we're going to aim for four hours. It's the bare minimum time for a job this size, but the line mustn't be closed for any longer. A rule of thumb that an hour of the uh, track occupancy was equivalent to about a million dollars. So every hour is down was about a million dollars wasted. From northwestern Australia, 1,600 kilometres south to Perth. Shunters are working late into the night to put together the final wagons of a 1.8 kilometre mega train. With a marathon journey ahead of it. 2,700 kilometres to go. Phil Garrett and Darren Blades are two of the four drivers that will work in relay to take the train virtually non-stop across the vast emptiness of the bottom half of Australia. 6 p.m. 9 is heading over the continent to Adelaide and on to Melbourne. All up, a 3,000 kilometre journey that will take three days. 4,133 tonne and we've got 76 wagons. So she's a pretty big train going back. 1,795 metres. Yeah, 6 p.m. 9, we're ready to depart, over. I'll get you some lights in a moment there, over. Righto, thank you. To eliminate fuel stops on the trip, the train tows two tanker loads of diesel, more than 50,000 litres, fed automatically to the engines. Uh, SCT 12 receiving. 
But the grind of one of the world's toughest rail journeys puts big pressure on the inline system. Yeah, just want to know how your fuel levels are going on your uh, low out there, mate. Drivers have reported problems with it. System technician Gary Aitken is riding to Adelaide to see what's going wrong. I've got a remote set up on the actual locomotive control box and that's sending a signal to my laptop just telling me exactly what that locomotive is doing. At the dawn crew change the following morning, they're more than 600 kilometres east of Perth. Good progress, but the rest of the trip is not looking so easy. I said the machine doesn't work. Yeah, that one. Yeah, OK. The automatic fueling system has continued to malfunction throughout the night. Gary Aitken still can't solve the problem. Just when you're going to, when it's finished, and when oh. you have it like a bump or a... Oh, right. yeah. oh, At the start of the next shift, it's a problem new drivers, Cookie and Ryan, will have to grapple with. And it's not one you want heading into this part of the world. From the Nullarbor Plain, across the continent to Port Augusta in South Australia. It's the famous outback train that refuses to die. Still full of life. After nearly a century of operation. The original GAN service. The train that conquered the desert between Adelaide and Alice Springs. Connecting Australia's red centre with the southern states. And it's still running today. Not quite as far, but with just as much fanfare. From Port Augusta in South Australia, 40 kilometres north to the township of Corn and back again. Pioneers started this line. Volunteers keep it going. I'm a Thomas the Tank Engine fan gone wrong. So my train sets just got bigger as I got older, you know. The train guard is 21-year-old Ben Grafey. The safety and the efficient running of the train, the running on time, all that kind of stuff is, is all on me. Engine number NM25. If anything goes wrong, the rail regulator comes to what I've done first, has a look at all of my paperwork and all that kind of stuff, and if something's wrong, it's my head on the chopping block. A full train is due out tomorrow. The rush is on to get everything prepared on time. Doing a uh, visual inspection of the, the firebox to make sure there's no, no leaks or weeps. It's a 150-year-old line and an 85-year-old train. Nothing can be left to chance. But there's one thing they can't control. The weather. And the forecast for tomorrow is for freakish conditions. Apparently we're going to experience the wildest, roughest, coldest weather we've seen in 25 to 30 years up in the Flinders Ranges. They're predicting snow is going to fall in the Flinders Ranges tonight. Transcontinental freight train 6pm9 is out on the Nullarbor Plain, far from civilization. Drivers Cookie and Ryan closely watching their worsening fuel situation. I think it's around 40,000 litres we use to go over, and probably around 25 to get home. The automatic filling system that feeds the locos from tankers they're pulling is behaving erratically. If the fuel in the locos drops too low, they'll have to stop and fuel them manually. In the crew cabin, fuel technician Gary Aitken is trying to find the fault. I can see the locomotive requesting fuel and I can actually see the locomotive in fueling mode and then cutting out. The engines are thirsty. They burn more than 800 litres of diesel an hour, nearly 100 times more than the average car. At a short stop to let another train pass, 
Gary does some quick tests on the electrics. The train's on a strict schedule. He can't hold it up for too long. Manually pumping the fuel will mean extra stops and lost time, and plenty of it. But the alternative is much worse, running too low. You don't like letting it run too low because it starts picking up the rubbish on the bottom of the tank, and then that can start blocking filters and it can give you different problems later on. So we try and keep as much in as we can. Cookie's taking advantage of the stop to pump in as much diesel as he can manually. He doesn't have long. There's another massive freight train heading his way. He'll need to make sure he's clear by the time it comes through. Cookie! Cookie's well clear by the time the freighter comes hurtling through. Gary still can't fix the problem. There's no more time. It's going to make it a bit awkward for the rest of the way home. But we're just going to have to stop. We're going to have to manually pump fuel in. And that knocks time out of us. So. Cookie gets 6 p.m. 9 going again while Ryan records their fuel consumption. Another two hours and we're seriously going to have to get some fuel into it. There's still 1,500 kilometres to go until Adelaide. Gary needs to find a solution to the fuel problem or they'll be stopping many more times. Freight worth hundreds of thousands of dollars won't be delivered in time. From halfway across the Nullarbor Plain, north to the iron ore mines of the Pilbara. The trains have stopped and the track maintenance workers are flat out. They have less than four hours to replace a 73 metre section of track. It's an incredibly tight period to do it in. I couldn't really sleep last night. The gang has to replace what's known as a turnout. The points that direct a train into a siding so another one can pass. Cutting that out at the moment and uh, just about to have the setting up the cranes. As they're getting ready to cut this out, the uh, excavators are on the other side there. And they're getting ready to pull this down the, the bank. Every person on the crew has their own job to do, and quickly. Some are in charge of heavy machinery. Others just have picks and shovels. It's tough work, made tougher by the looming deadline. After less than an hour of cutting, digging, scraping, it's time for the big boys to move in. The mission is to get the old line out of the way as fast as possible. Save it. We're not being gentle with it. We just want it out as quick as we can. It's a lightning fast demolition job. 100 tons, 73 metres of steel rail and concrete sleepers scraped off the rocky ballast. Next, graders move in to prep the base for the new section. Yeah, Michael, come back. Can you clean that cut all the way up? You're on height now. Three cranes wait to play their part. They are pretty heavy duty cranes. Uh, we've had to do a fair bit of earthworks for the cranes here. The rip out takes less than an hour, but that's the easy part. Lifting and lining up the new section requires precision and patience. 
the drivers of these huge ore trains trust their lives to these workers. They have to get this repair exactly right. Track maintenance is so important. Essentially, my life is in their hands. If I go across a, a broken rail joint or something like that, potentially, they could have a derailment and potentially that, that could be, uh, you know, a catastrophic incident. Meanwhile, the trains are stopped and the meter is ticking over at a million dollars an hour. There's been a crew change on 6 p.m. 9. Darren and Phil are back up front. Take main line, cross 4 p.m. 4. The train pushes on into the vast expanse of the Nullarbor. This is the mine's probably a little bit away, a couple of minutes. What do you want, your vest in or not? Cookie and Ryan are relaxing in the crew car. Can't get better than that when you're in the middle of nowhere, steak and veg. And Gary is still trying to solve the fuel problem. Yeah, just checking to see what your fuel levels are up on that front loco, mate. The tanks are running low and they'll need to stop soon to fill them manually. One of the locomotives has been um, just malfunctioning electrically, um, so I'm just uh, remotely monitoring that on my laptop. If you, if you see it getting a bit erratic, just give us a call. The crew cabin is a mini hotel designed so the off-duty drivers can rest, eat and relax. People spend thousands of dollars to come out here to look at the view and we get to do it for free. But up front in the loco, the drivers have to be ever alert, ready for anything. Two years ago, in the dead of night, Darren was at the controls when disaster struck. So it was midnight, so it was totally dark, and it was rainy, so our headlights weren't that bright. As we kept going down the hill, we saw more and more water, and it sort of looked like, as we got down further, a couple of rivers, and we got a bit worried, and eventually, as we got to the bottom, the water was actually running across the track. And we was already doing 95 to 100 kilometres an hour, so we both took a deep breath, and we were a bit worried about what's going to happen. When we first hit it, it was just like a bit of a bump, but uh, the guys that were in bed, they actually got thrown out of bed. We just saw trucks on their sides, wagons on their sides, the track washed away. What it was, it was a once in 100 year rain event and all that water had run down the hill and it formed a big lake right at the bottom. So as our loco went over it, it allowed the water to push all the ballast through and uh, every time another set of wheels came over it, it made it worse until just caused a big derailment. Darren and his crew were stranded for days. We just had to sit tight and it took them about two days before anyone could get out there because of the flooding and because of the isolation of it. And so we just slept in the coach as we normally would until they came to rescue us, basically. Eventually, they were flown out in a light plane. It took two weeks to clear the only track across the continent and get the trains running again. On this trip, the problem isn't water, it's fuel. The tanks on the locos are at worryingly low levels. At the next crew change, they'll have to manually pump in as much diesel as they can. That will mean more delays and less chance of getting this freight to its destination on time. In South Australia, torrential rain is the last thing that volunteers from the Pitchy Ritchie Rail Group want. From lighting the match to in steam is around about four hours. They're getting their vintage steam train fired up for a run into the outback with a full load of passengers. The wet will make the already difficult conditions more challenging. I've got to watch out for wheel slip. If I get excessive wheel slip, I can destroy the motion on the locomotive. Today, the welfare of the train and its passengers will be in the hands of the guard, Ben Grafey. It does feel a little bit unnerving because, you know, you've got the same responsibilities as someone that, that's actually getting the big bucks to do this, you know, we're all volunteers. The train's ready to go. Thanks in order. 
always have a red flag in case something goes wrong. Ben's determined that it leaves exactly on time. We're only a tourist railway, but we say we're going to depart at 10.30, so we've got to depart at 10.30, and that's just how it is. One minute to go. All right, just keep check with conductor. You, everyone on board, Mr Conductor. Ready for departure. All aboard! It's all aboard, except for the guard. Crossing is activated. Good. They can't go without him. <whistles> the Pitchy Richie steam train is off on a ride into the past. Along a century old route, the start of the original journey connecting Australia's south to its remote north. But it's far from a nostalgic trip for driver Neil and his crew. We're looking for any moisture, any build-up of water along the track anywhere from overnight rain, which will cause it to slip. The line they're travelling on is old and cuts through some of the toughest country around, made more hazardous from the overnight rains. We'll take it a little bit more cautiously through the cuttings because there may have been some rock slips. <laughs> It's an area where it's, it's formed of uh, large rocks and, and fine silt, so when it rains, it washes away the silt, exposes the rocks, and they tend to then slide down under their own self-weight after a while, so we'll keep an eye out. Squeezing through cuttings so narrow, you can touch the sides. the back, Ben keeps a constant eye out for trouble. And I can observe the train um, quite effectively, keep an eye on things and make sure that nothing goes wrong. Trees on the line, kangaroos, sheep, all that kind of fun stuff. So if I'm watching what's going on, I can at least be a little bit prepared when something does go pear-shaped. It's an experience from another era, from the glory days of steam, when the railroad was sometimes the only road. But there's no time for daydreaming for Neil. He's still battling up a steep incline and making matters worse, the forecast rain has arrived. The driver has to be a little bit more sensitive with the controls in case the loco goes into a wheel slip. If the wheels slip, the train could lose momentum and stall. It's not far from the top of the rise. Suddenly... The spot of a tree down in front of us. One of the busiest mining railways in the country is closed. Trains pulling millions of dollars worth of iron ore are at a standstill. The line has been shut down, so a section can be replaced. On the track, there's a frenzy of activity. The guys are just doing their grading of the ballast at the moment. Turnout will go on top of that. Still lots to go. There's still the welding, the tamping, uh, and of course the crane lift to put the, the turnout in. Part one of this job was to rip and remove a 73 metre section of line. They have less than three hours to replace it so the trains can start running again. Part two is preparing the base for the new track. The rock ballast that holds the rails in place needs to be perfectly flat. We'll get the bottom of the ballast level down so that we get the top rail level height, correct? And uh, yeah, once we level it all out, the guys will do a bit of hand digging, but mostly work with the diggers. This line is the strongest rail line there is. It has to be. It carries the heaviest trains in the world. The rails can support wagons each weighing up to 160 tonnes, 250 per train. The clock is ticking. We'll be doing a few activities at the same time so that we um, minimise the time. Three cranes are on standby 
to lift 100 tonnes of steel rail and concrete sleepers all in one piece. Swinging a piece of track this size, this weight, exactly into position, takes a lot of skill and a lot of lifting power. What it can't take is a lot of time. It'll be all guns blazing shortly. The guys will be keen. No one's sitting down, everyone's ready to go. If they get it wrong, they'll have to raise it and set it again. Two hours left, and the hardest part still to come. Back at the mine, million dollar ore trains are standing idle. That costs money. Cookie and Ryan are back on the night shift on the SCT train. Their automatic fueling system is still not working properly. The Locos tanks are running very low. We're going to have to stop somewhere to put some fuel in. Cookie doesn't have to wait long. There's another train on coming and controllers have pulled them into a siding to let it pass. They have just a few minutes to manually pump fuel. But Ryan has discovered the situation's worse than they thought. Neither of them are working now. They've both stopped working in auto. Before, it was only the pump on one of the tanks that was playing up. Now, there's double trouble. So we just got to pump as much in as we can every time we stop. Uh, and if we start getting real low, we're just going to have to make a stop to pump fuel. It's frustratingly slow. I have to manually hold my finger on the button. Uh, it's just a safety thing, so we don't overflow the tanks. We have to manually stand here and hold the button in. Ryan is standing next to the main line. With the other train due soon, he can't stay there too long. This is a tight cross as well, so we're not going to be able to get much in. Very time-consuming process. I said we might only get a thousand litres in this back engine at the moment, so we're going to have to stop again later and take fuel. And that's going to delay us. They can't let the Locos fuel tanks run too low. If the engine starts sucking up dirty diesel, they could fail. Ryan needs to radio the other train to see where it is, while Cookie takes over the fuel pumping. The button's on the main line side, so be careful. And give us a call when he gets close. I can see he's had light here. Can't be far away. Ryan has to wait in the pitch black on his own. At least he hopes he's on his own. You always got to be a little bit careful of cattle and stuff like that running around, though. You never know what they're doing. A lot of blokes have been scared by them, <laughs> like kangaroos jumping past. You just can't see them. But yeah, we are out in the middle of nowhere, that's for sure. You wouldn't want to hurt yourself. Like, you, you've got to be a little bit careful. If I got bitten by a snake right now, it's going to take a long time to get help, because you'd be in a lot of trouble. But maybe when you're out in the or maybe dingoes, getting run over by a mob of cows. Apart from that, I think we're pretty safe. The driver of the other train radios his position. SV7 PM9, just call your location this time, fellas. Yeah, no worries, mate. Thanks for that. We're on the loop. You're right, come through. So here it comes. He's only he's two and a half kilometres away. At last it arrives. The stop has allowed them to manually pump in fuel, but not enough. They can't afford to be stopped any longer. No worries, take that, mate. Have a good one. How about you, dude? 6 p.m. 9 has to get going. It's crunch time for the Fortescue Track maintenance team, fixing the rail line in northwestern Australia. They're racing the clock to replace a 73-metre section of track. We're just steady, steady, putting the, putting the lift in, crucial part. This is the trickiest part of the mission. Oh, yeah, we'll just put it on those pads, mate. Three towering cranes coordinating to lower 100 tonnes of track and sleepers into exactly the right position. 
suppose the measurement's supposed to be from there to there, though. They're down to two hours left. So it does have to come this way. Those end of rails have to come down this end then, mate. It's more complicated than just setting the line in place. Uh, we're just wiring up the new points machine that's going in that we're taking out with the old, the old turnout. So this is the new motor that goes in. There's a switching mechanism and motor that have to be fitted so that the points work. But then we've got detection then there's a chance there that the, the switch is open and the train can fall straight into the straight off and derail. So we're talking two or three mil at times um, with our adjustments, so it's gotta be pretty precise. Are you happy with the center or do you want me to push it over a bit more? The pressure's on. This is a time for cool heads. How close is that Mookie? just that way a bit more, is it? Yeah, yep, let's throw the rails in, guys. We just want to check for square as well. Oh, it looks pretty good. Center, center looks good. Yep, go. It sits perfectly in place. It was a big lift, so yeah, about 100 tonne. We just had up in the air then. Um, but the main thing was, this bit just underneath me here is square, so that's the most critical part of this, having to point the switch square, and we got it, so. Huge relief, you got to bang on the money. Yeah, we're happy. Now they need to make sure it stays there. In less than an hour, the world's heaviest trains are due to roll through here. Jacking it up, propping it up. As soon as we get it to the right height, we'll start uh, dropping ballast on it. Uh, the hand tamping now that lifts the track, it also does alignment, so it will also align the track. And it's also getting consolidation of the ballast underneath the bearers, so that it'll hold the weight of the train. The Bitchy Ritchie steam train has had to make a sudden stop. There are tree branches on the line. Some too big to risk running a train over. It's been fairly windy overnight. But it had the potential to cause a problem, but we'll just get rid of them. OK. The train's ready to go again, but they're on a hill. Right at the top of the hill. The fire needs more coal. The engine needs as much power as they can muster. We're always uh, on the lookout for something that's uh, not normal. Something like that. It was only relatively small, but it could have been quite big and it could have got nasty for us. So we keep an eye on things, keep it all safe. Soon, the engine is puffing its way to the halfway mark, arriving at the historic station of Corn. Bang on time. These were the things you, you saw as a kid on all the TV shows and you know, all the old movies. You see the guard there with his green flag and blow on the whistle, and 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 all the kids they they, they love seeing you do this, and 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 the big kids. <laughs> so yeah, it's just fantastic. And here we go. A steam train out here may be a novelty, but for Ben, it's also a big responsibility. He needs to stay alert for any possible emergency. This time, the problem's on the train not the tracks. Any system, call. Over. Roger that. Thank you, NM25. I'll check it out. The emergency signalling system has just been activated, so we've got to go and check out and make sure that everything is OK. Did you press the panic button? Anyone in your carriage? Can you find the conductor for me, please? The press it in here. They press it in here? Yeah. 
Accidentally or? Yes. Accidentally, okay. Yeah. That suits me fine. Yes. <laughs> um, Andrew, anyone, everyone in your, all right in your carriage? No worries. All right, false alarm. Good. Get going again. <laughs> The train is soon steaming back to home base at Port Augusta. Back on the main line, sharing it with trains from the modern era. It provides a bit of fun for the passengers. Passengers all love it. The crews of the freight trains love it. it shows us how far we've come as a, as a country in our railways. I just can't believe how eventful this trip has been today. <laughs> Workers on the Fortescue track replacement have less than an hour before the line needs to be reopened. I think time-wise, we're still just barely on the money. The new track has to be welded to the old section. And the rough joins ground back so they're perfectly smooth, all under the pressure of the clock. Half an hour to go in the, uh, the window. The last stage is calling in the tamping machine. It gets the top of the rail to the correct level so we don't get any dips in it. And it also does alignment and it vibrates the ballast underneath the bearers and then that consolidates all the ballast and then we know that we're safe. It's the machine that makes sure the track's perfectly aligned. The giant ore trains are ready to run again. They still don't have permission to roll. If the team goes over time, each minute will cost $17,000. Had a pressure off. They've done it. With just minutes to spare. A triumph. But the only way to test if they've succeeded... <laughs> ..is to run a train over the top. So for 20 kilometres an hour for the first train, just to be sure. And then after that, we'll lift up to 40 kilometres an hour. of wagons. The ultimate test. Yeah, we're all happy now. I've seen that train go over. It actually increased the speed while I was travelling through these. We're pretty confident with the ride. It's a huge relief and back to business on one of the richest railway lines in the world. We'll get some more down the port and uh, we'll get the ships moving from there. Everybody worked well, got everything up and running. Great day and we're knocking off on time. Cookie and Ryan have driven throughout the night. I don't know what time it is, 7 o'clock, the sun's just coming up. So this is the worst time when you're feeling most tired. They decide to leave the fuel problem until the crew change. I think we've got about another hour and a little bit to go. When they stop, Gary is quickly back working on the tankers. The train's tanks are almost drained. Well, we just got down to 2,500 litres and you don't really want to get down below 1,500 litres because then you start having uh, pick-up problems. If you get some dirty fuel in there, you'll stuff your injectors up. There's a train due to pass them in a few minutes. They're already more than an hour behind schedule and this fuel stop is critical. We're going to manually fuel and hopefully get about five or 6,000 litres in, which will be enough to get us back to Adelaide. When the other train has passed, 
they'll have to get moving again. And Gary should find out whether he's fixed the problem. Phil and Darren are back in the cabin, closely monitoring the fuel situation that's dogged them for the whole trip. It's been a long five days, pretty exhausted. But up ahead... Hey, there's a pot of gold at the end of that road. There's a glimmer of hope on the fuel front. The running repairs at the last stop seem to have done the job. Yeah, that's excellent news. The system's working perfectly. Adelaide is only 300 kilometres away, and they should be able to make up some time. No, it's good to be going home, no doubt about that. The trip is nearly over. Four drivers have been away from home for five days, travelled more than 5,000 kilometres across the harsh emptiness of the Australian continent. Another crew will take the train on to its destination of Melbourne. But for these four, it's the end of the line. Got about four days off, so that's pretty handy. <laughs> so, and see my little fella and my wife, so that'll be good. Great to be home. It's been a good trip, five days away, and uh, we arrived here a bit late. We lost a bit of time, but yeah, I'm looking forward to getting home and going to bed in a bed that doesn't move.